Hey, um, and welcome to lecture five of the intro to CVD Cal. So this lecture is going to be on introductions, introduction to CNNs. We have already given this lecture in person, but due to some technical difficulties on our end, the video of the lecture did not record. So this is a recording of a lecture that we have done later in time so that students who did not, who were not able to show up can still go through it um, later. Right, so uh, this lecture is very much going to focus on the most basic sort of ML model that you see in computer vision. And before we motivate what that model can be or what the model looks like, let's try to ask ourselves what computer vision even is in the first place. So at a high level, computer vision is simply the field of AI that deals with anything that involves sort of extracting information from an image. At a low level, it's a set of tasks that revolve around concepts like classification, detection, segmentation, et, et, et cetera. So anything that requires a machine to have a semantic understanding of what's going on inside an image. So again, the, there are multiple ways in which this can sort of take place. So the, the most canonical, or I guess the most famous task that you might've heard before taking this class is, uh, uh, is out of classification. So the problem of classification is to simply, you know, just classify what kind of object is in an image. Now, that is all well and good, and there are many models that can do that, but what if you want to go a step further? So instead of just classifying where or what, what, what an object in an image is, maybe you also want to um, sort of point out its location with, say, a bounding box. So we know that here we are looking at an image of a cat, but instead of just classifying that as a cat, we also point out where the where this cat in particular is. Now again, you can take a step further and instead of you know detecting a single object, you can try to detect multiple objects because that is usually the case in many real world images. So um, if you have like say different kinds of animals in an image, you could try to um, uh, you, you try to predict the positions not of not only the cat, but also say the dog and you know the, the rubber ducky at, at, at the very bottom. And again, you could go even further instead of you know just making a box, you could predict their outlines. Now these are different kinds of CV tasks that we will sort of indulge in over the next couple of weeks. But the main thing that is in common between all of them is all of these tasks will require a machine learning model to have a high level understanding of what a dog or what a cat is, right? It, 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 uh, when it just sees that image to it, it, it's just a series of pixels and the way it can sort of interpret meaning from those pixels is what we will be focusing on. So computer vision has its roots in cognitive science and psychology. So uh, there were there was a, there was an experiment performed in 1959 by neurobiologists Hubel and Easel who were experimenting on cats. They wanted to see if they could sort of probe the visual cortex of a cat, and they showed this uh, and they showed it like different kinds of patterns, what kind of activations they can they could like sort of observe, and then they noticed that um, simple edges like um, or like simple patterns like edges led to the highest activations. And they were able to figure out that a cat is trying to break an image down by looking at different kinds of edges first. And this led to many developments in computer vision. Uh, computer scientists started to take inspiration from this experiment and they decided and they decided to make feature extractors that were say based on edge information. So, um, you know, one common example in, in in this image that you would be seeing is that of hog. And when they're extracting these like different kinds of features, they would train like, you know, different kinds of classical machine learning models on top of those. And this is how CV was usually done for a very long time. 
but then deep learning came in. Now, remember back to lecture four, we talked about how the difference between shallow learning or classical ML and deep learning is that you allow a model to not only learn a mapping from you know the features to an output, but you also allow a model to learn the feature extractors themselves. So um, in, in, in classical methods, we were sort of hand programming these um, feature extractors like Sift or Hog or Daisy. Again, you don't need to worry about what these like specific extractors are because we will not focus on them. Uh, uh, the, core, the focus of this course is on deep learning, not classical CV. And it, it, it turns out that you could like simply replace them with you know neural networks and learn something even and learn like even better and better models. And, and in particular, this breakthrough came in 2012 when a certain computer scientist by the name of Alex Krzyzewski demonstrated that you could train huge neural networks that could massively outperform, you know, these like classical models. So the way you typically use deep learning for computer vision is through the special kind of model called a convolutional neural network. Um, they were first developed by Jan LeCun in the in, in the early 1990s. I believe that he first tested um, this approach in 1989. I, I think it might be an year or two off, but it was something it was something around that ballpark. And again, um, this was a massively successful sort of experiment by him. He was able to show that he could use neural networks to say recognize handwritten digits from an image. And at that point, deep learning started to become more and more widely adopted. And it finally exploded in 2012 when, again, Alex Krzyzewski came up with this model called the AlexNet. He demonstrated that if you use like large models with huge, with, with a huge amount of compute and huge data sets, you could train really high performing models. And, and, and he was able to sort of train the best model uh, until then, uh, in, 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 in this challenge called the ImageNet Visual Recognition Challenge. Uh, we'll touch on that slightly at the end, but you just need to know that this model was a huge turning point for deep learning, and it sort of led to the deep learning revolution and led to the state of deep learning research as we know today. Again, um, so the ImageNet classification challenge is a, is a is an annual competition, and 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 you can see um, sort of the massive transformation that AlexNet had in 2012. The previous approach before him had a really high error rate, and AlexNet almost reduced it by a very significant margin. And it is only you know since going down as better and better models come out. Um, we will talk about some of these models that you see here, like VGG, um, I believe Inception Net or Google LayNet and ResNet in the next lecture on advanced architectures. But all of these models have something in common is that they are all based on convolutional layers, which is gonna be the focus of today's lecture. So before we delve into um, you know, these like CNN based models, let's try to answer a very crucial question we are trying to work with images, but how do we represent images in the first place? Like to a computer, what, what, is, what, is, what exactly does a computer read when it sees an image? And the question we wanna ask is how do we you know, represent these images digitally? And the answer is, well, simply as matrices. So you know, when we talk about an image, it has an associated height and a width. You could simply view that as the number of rows and columns in, in a uh, of a matrix. And each say value of this matrix uh, represents, you know, some kind of um, brightness um, from, you know, white being the brightest color and black being, you know, the, you know, the darkest color. And this is typically how you would represent grayscale images. Um, again, um, you would use a brightness value that ranges from zero to 255. Um, why is it 255? Uh, it's so that we could have, we could represent each pixel with, in just eight bits because you have 256 possible uh, numbers in that range, which is represented, which is, um, which can be represented by a single byte. So uh, essentially what's going on is that each pixel is, can be represented by a single byte. And 
I think that's a pretty good analogy. If you have taken uh, some computer, computer architecture classes, you might see why this might make sense. Um, so, you know, just to recap, um, each image in grayscale is simply a matrix with a pixel value in the range from 0 to 255. But we don't always work with grayscale images. We typically want to work with colored images because those are sort of, you know, more realistic. Now, there are many ways to denote color in the sense that you could break a color down into different kinds of components. You could break a color down into, say, um, RG, um, RGB, uh, R, G, and B values. Like um, each color can be composed of like different shades of red, green, and blue. You can also break a color down into other color spaces like CIE Lab or YUV, for example. We will go ahead with RGB because it is simply, you know, the most common color space out there and pretty much everyone uses it. So we know that each pixel, each colored pixel can be broken down into um, three different values, which means if you have a matrix, um, which means that if, if you were to consider your original colored image with some height and width, you know that each, each pixel in that image is going to have three values. So you could construct three different matrices for each particular, you know, component. And in, in a sense, you could like just stack those on top of each other. So if you're working with RGB, you could create a matrix for the color R, you could make a matrix for the color um, green, you can make a matrix for the color blue. And sort of composing them with each other will, you know, yield the original image back. Um, this is a pretty important concept um, as to how we are breaking down an image into you know different kinds of matrices, and and it turns out that um, when these like matrices are stacked on stacked on top of each other, so let's say that each image is has it so say that your image has a height of two fifty six and a width of two fifty six, this would mean that you have three two fifty six by two fifty six matrices. So what you're doing now is instead of looking at a single matrix, you're looking at more of a 3D matrix with dimensions three by 256 by 256. And this three accounts for the fact that you have three different matrices, right? Um, in, in deep learning literature, we call this generalized 3D representation of a matrix a tensor. So in a sense, you could break each image down into, a, a, you, you could represent each image by a tensor. And this like three at the very beginning is referring to the number of channels that the sensor have. Okay, um, just wanna make sure that you guys pause this video, make sure you understand what's going on in this picture, make sure you understand the concept of colored images and channels, because this is gonna be very important going forward. Okay, assuming you have done that, we can finally motivate why we wanna use convolutional neural networks. So before we motivate, um, why a CNN might be helpful, let's try to see why a regular NN or a multi-layer perceptron as you have encountered, or as you may have seen in the previous deep learning lectures might not be too helpful. So say that you're working with a 200 by 200 by three image, again, uh, since, we had, since we just came off of a discussion of colored images, this means that we, uh, this image has a height of 200, a width of 200, and this is probably an RGB image because it has three different channels or, or a depth of three. Um, in order to pass this image through a dense layer that we might see in a fully connected network, you would have to convert it to a vector. So if you look at where my cursor is pointing, um, this is exactly what a dense layer in a neural network does. It's basically a matrix multiplication and bias addition operation, right? So we would need to somehow convert this image into a vector that can be multiplied by a matrix of weights. Now, one, one way to do that is to like simply squash this 3D like tensor into a single vector. And since the original 3D tensor had 200 by 200 by three images, your final vector would end up having um, 120,000 elements. Now let's suppose that the output of this 3D, let's say that the output of this layer that we're passing this like image vector into is supposed to be 10. So we are passing in a 120,000 dimensional vector and we are expecting an output that is 10 dimensional. 
I want you guys to pause this video and answer the question, how many parameters will this fully connected layer have? Again, this fully connected layer is taking an input with, uh, is, is taking a 120,000 dimensional input and it's outputting a 10 dimensional vector. Okay, assuming you guys have paused and given it a go, let's look at the answer. So since you have a 10 dimensional output, your weight matrix would need to have dimensions 10 by 120,000, right? So this would mean that your weight matrix has 1.2 million uh, weights. And, and similarly, you also add a bias vector to the output, right? This bias vector is supposed to be 10 dimensional. So there's gonna be 10 other parameters that come from the bias vector. And which is exactly why we have 1.2 million plus 10 or 1.2 million and 10 parameters. Now, this is way too much. And again, we are only looking at a 10 dimensional output. 10 is not even that big. Normally you would want to look at maybe say a, a thousand dimensional output, right? So if you're looking at a thousand dimensional output, then this layer itself would have 120 million parameters instead. And this is only a single layer. And we are already exceeding, like not necessarily exceeding, but we are already have, but we're already at like this such a big capacity, right? Um, and 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 you can imagine like you 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 already have such a huge network that you would have trouble training and you you would also have to store it at some point. It's simply like too unwieldy. And as you add more and more layers, because you know as as we saw in the previous lecture on on pre training, um, is that you know typically adding more layers uh, allows you to like better, learn better and better representations adding more layers will simply add to the parameter count and simply make this network, this already big network, even bigger. That is not ideal. Another reason why this formulation might not exactly work is you are treating each individual pixel as a different feature. Now recall, um, each vector that goes into a dense layer or a layer of this form over here um is assumed to be some vector of features if we are come if we are flattening out all of the pixels into a vector we are saying that each pixel can be represented by a, as a separate feature and in the case of images this does not exactly make sense again i would encourage you guys to you know pause the video think about why this is you know kind of unorthodox or or, or weird by you know treating each image pixel as a separate feature. Okay, assuming you guys have given it a go, let's 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 go through some of the reasons. So before we delve into why this might be a bad idea, let's think about how we as humans classify objects. So say that I present you with an image of this swan. Um, the way you would recognize this image as, you know, as that of a swan that's floating on water is you would break this image down into different parts, look at each part separately and sort of like assemble like those parts back together. So you would, you know, maybe focus on its, you know, orange beak um, first, and then maybe shift your focus to the its, to its like long neck, or maybe it's like oval body or the, fact, or the fact that it's like floating on water, right? And you're using all of these like different kinds of like these like different patches of this image to construct to to sort of like construct this mental model of what a swan is, and and based on that classifying that image as as that of a swan, right? Um, let's look at exactly what's going on over here. We are saying that instead of looking at the entire image by itself, it might be better to look at different patches or regions of an image at once and sort of combine the information from those patches together at the end. So uh, again, the, the idea is that we wanna look at local regions instead of like individual pixels. And I, I think this sort of would make sense, would make more sense with, with, with another example. Say, if you guys can see my uh, cursor, if you're zooming in to this patch over here, you can kind of make out that this is 
does that this patch contains a, a sunflower. But if you were to say zoom in and consider a single pixel at once, say something on the petal, then you would just see this like yellow dot and that doesn't give you any information, right? You need to look at the neighboring pixels to figure out what's going on. Um, it, it, it turns out that in images, these like neighboring pixels are very, very strongly correlated to each other and they contain information that is not, that, that you simply cannot glean from a single pixel. And this sort of structure of an image is not exactly, it, it doesn't exactly lend itself to the um, neural network template that we have been seeing so far. Because again, those will treat each image pixel separately. We, we don't want to do that. We want to look at regions of images, at, uh, regions of pixels at once. And, and this idea is not exactly new to deep learning. It's very popular in classical CV2. So this is this the slide over here shows an example of a very famous feature extractor called Canny Edge Detection. It, it simply retrieves the edges from this image. Now, if you think about it, you can't really retrieve, you can't really form or like sort of extract edges from an image by just looking at single pixels at, at a time, right? You would have to look at regions of pixels to find, say, the orientation of an edge. And yeah, the, this idea of local regions is more relevant to an image than is 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 more concerned with the structure of an image than it is with you know say something than than it is with a particular technique like deep learning. Um, this is an aside. This feature extractor is also called the Kenny edge detector and was actually made by Berkeley professor John Kenny. Uh, if you guys don't know who he is, I believe he used to be the head of the department uh, a few years ago. Um, another, another thing that we might desire when building some sort of model that processes images is we need to extract representations. So recall that deep learning is a process of extracting hierarchical representations from an input. We talked about this idea in the representation learning part of the pre-training lecture. So if this sort of terminology doesn't make sense. I would encourage you guys to you know, pause this video, go back to it, review that lecture, um, and come back to it later, and come back to this lecture later. So, so what this means is that we want to learn representations that sort of depend on each other. So, we would start with you know the very basics, uh, which can be something like you know information about edges, textures, colors that you can retrieve from you know just the pixels themselves. Then we want to learn representations that depend on these like basic level of representations, such as you know shapes and patterns. We can combine information about edges and textures to form different kinds of shapes that might be in an image. And I think this is sort of more prevalent in the in the example to the right. So the very bottom layer, layer one, is, is trying to look for different kinds of edges. And once it has sort of retrieved that information, it can combine edge information to look for different kinds of shapes in an image. And finally, as you sort of go deeper and deeper into your network, you would combine like different kinds of shapes and patterns into a abstract representation of what a, what a face looks like. And, and the reason this representation is abstract is because we don't know, we can't really interpret what's going on or what this representation looks like, but your model will be able to. And you know that's kind of the important part. Again, if you can sort of look at, look, look to the example at the right, once you have sort of formed these like different kinds of patterns in layer two, you can combine you know, parts of them and make out like different faces and your, your model is then going to be looking for those in an image. Let's see what else we might require um, from a good you know, image-based model. So there are two important concepts that I want to sort of um, touch upon. So one is called translational equi um, equivariance. This is the idea that if you have some set of pixels and you have some and you have its representation, if you are to you know say translate the pixels, you should also translate the representations. So uh, if you if you look at this example down below, we uh, to the right or to the left, we have this image of the number two, 
and say we pass it through some neural network layer. Um, I don't know what kind of layer this is, but let's say that there is there exists some layer that gives you this representation um, in, in, in the top left. Now, if you were to say like translate this T to the right, you would ideally also want the representation to move as well, right? It's not like the semantic meaning of the image changes if the two shifts position. This image still has a two and this representation should not really change based on position. Um, another concept that we want is something called translational invariance. So this is simply saying that, you know, even if we translate this number two, the semantic meaning of this image does not change. So let's say that we were training a model to classify the digit in an image. Um, the left uh, image would yield an answer two, but even if we were to say translate this two to the right, we would so like the answer two to pop out at the end, right? Because the fact that you still have the same digit does not change. So these sort of features are can't really be worked out in the traditional dense neural network architecture, which is why we turn to this new kind of model called the CNN. And, and we will sort of see soon enough that a CNN can sort of fulfill or satisfy all of the um, criteria that we just laid out. Okay, so let's move on to the concept of convolutions. Uh, the CNN is, uh, is is short for a convolutional neural network, and this idea of convolutions sort of lie at the base of this uh, of this like new kind of model. Okay, so we laid out some uh, some like uh, requirements that we want this model to you know to have. So we first of all we laid out the fact that this model should instead of you know processing entire images at once we should be processing you know, different kinds of patches instead. And we could assemble the process output of an image by, pro by, uh, by sort of like assembling the process output of each patch and, you know, I don't know, like concatenating or something um, them together at the, at the very end. So uh, what, what was, what's in, in other words, we are forcing the model to pay attention to local regions of an image instead of the whole you know, sort of uh, instead of the whole image at once. Finally, we also talked about this area of like translational equivariance and translational invariance. So the idea is that if we were to say sample some region of patches in one position, if we are to encounter that same region of patches in a different positions, and in a different position, we should get the same representation out. So say that if we are processing each patch. This would mean that we want each patch to go through the same layer in order to yield the same representation. Uh, or in other words, we will pass each patch through a layer with the same weights and biases. This idea is called weight sharing. And we will see soon enough how this idea sort of manifests itself in the CNN. So, okay, with these initial ideas in mind, we are now ready to define the convolution operation. The convolution operation, um, I'll first go over how this um, operation is performed before trying to explain what's intuitively going on. So the convolution operation involves two different components. You have an input image and you have something called a weight filter. This weight filter is simply a tiny matrix that you can slide over your image and take dot products along the way. So what's, what's happening is um, you, you, you line up this image in the top left corner, you take the product, you take the element wise product of the filter with the patch of the image that this filter is covering and you, you, you sum those up and you can repeat this process by sliding this filter across and concatenating the outputs that you get. Again, um, just to this, just to go over this process once more, I want to make sure that you understand what's going on here mechanically because this is gonna like underlie the entire this this is the main foundation for the entire lecture. So we we take this weight filter, we slide it along the image by a certain amount, and at each time step we compute the dot product between the entries of the filter and the input 
that it's covering, right? And the reason we call it dot product is because we are element wise summing the filter and 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 an input patch and summing and and we are taking the element wise product of an of a filter and an input patch and summing the results. This is exactly how a dot product is performed between vectors. Now, um, again, keep in mind that there is also going to be a bias term involved. So, like after we you know sum everything together, we would add, we would tack on a bias term at the very end. In our examples, it's not present, but in a real CNN, this would be this would this would be something that you have to keep in mind. So um, at the moment, this um, this sort of like process might seem very arbitrary, but and and but it but it does satisfy our initial ideas, right? So this process of convolutions is making sure that we're only looking at single patches of the input at once instead of the entire image. We are building up the process output of the image by sort of concatenating the process output of each patch. And furthermore, we are using the same filter for each patch. So we are essentially sharing the weights, right? It fulfills all of our initial uh, desiderata, right? And it, it turns out that this process isn't exactly something that was arbitrarily chosen. It actually has a very, um, it, 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 it it's doing something very particular, and I'm hoping that the next example will sort of make that clear. So let's say that we have this input image on the left, and we have this very particular weight filter um, in the center. We want to see what happens if we convolve this input image with this particular weight filter. What would we, what would be the output that we get? So say we um, overlay this filter on the top right patch of the image. What would the output be? So again, we would have 10 times one plus 10 times one plus 10 times one plus 10 times zero plus 10 times zero plus 10 times zero plus 10 times negative one plus 10 times negative one plus 10 times negative one. So all the cancel like sort of cancel out and you would just be left with zero here. Now we slide this filter uh, by one unit to the left and we repeat this process. We would, you know, sum up all the tens uh, along this row because we have those, because the filter has a, uh, a column of ones here. We would ignore all of these things because the filter has a row of zeros here. And we would also ignore sort of like this column over here because the image has a row of zeros here. So we would get 10 plus 10 plus 10, which is a 30. Again, we could repeat this process again. We would get another 30. And similarly, once we slide on to this like region of all zeros, we just get a zero. And you can repeat this process for the entire image. And this is what the convolved output looks like. Let's actually see what's going on over here. Um, this convolved output has a bunch of zeros along the left and right edge, right? And it has a bunch of 30s along the middle. Let's forget what the actual numbers in there are for a minute. And instead of you know focusing on the zeros and the 30s, let's just say that this convolved feature has low values on the edges, but high values along the middle. Let's look at what's going on in, uh, in the image in the middle. Uh, and, and between the second, between the third and the fourth columns, what we are seeing is this transition between this like column of tens to a column of zeros. What's What this means is that there is this like very explicit boundary or an edge and this filter has high activations along this edge, but low activations elsewhere. So this is exactly what's going on over here. This filter is trying to detect vertical edges in an image, right? It's trying to give you high values where it thinks that it has a, that, that there's a high likelihood of being an edge, and it's gonna give you low values where it thinks that it has a low, where the image has a low likelihood of, of having an edge. So, and we, we, we just noticed that we turned this like very arbitrary looking process of convolution into something that's returning something semantically meaningful, right? We can extract edge information by this very carefully designed filter. And it turns out that edge is not the only information you could sort of extract. You can define different kinds of filters in a very specific way to extract different kinds of information. So you could um, 
So earlier we were only looking at like um, vertical edges. You could look at different kinds of edges at once with you know a more general edge detector. You could also try to extract an an image that is say sharpened by you know sliding over this particular filter over um, over an image. And and it turns out that this idea of convolutions actually dates back to classical CV. This is not a new idea that deep learning researchers proposed. Um, people have been using convolutions in digital image processing and classical CV for a long time. But this class is deep learning. Where does the deep learning part come in? So we just saw that these filters can extract different kinds of features from an image. These filters are basically feature extractors. Recall what we said in lecture four, deep learning is the process where you convert the feature extractor to something that can be learned. So, you know, if like the fully connected dense layers that we know and love, what if we try to learn these filters? So, you know, instead, instead of, you know, hand programming um, a edge director filter, we say that, okay, this particular filter is just, a, is just a bunch of parameters and we will allow the network to decide what kind of filter it wants to use on that particular image, right? Now, if you did go to lecture four, you might've seen these um, like images um, in there. And at first it might not have made any sense. This is, um, this image is representing what learned filters might look like. Again, if this doesn't make too much sense, don't worry about it. Um, sort of like trying to interpret what's going on in a CNN can be very challenging. And I would not want you guys to like waste time over trying to interpret like every single detail. But that's uh, the, this image, I included this image here just to sort of give you an idea of what's really going on inside a CNN. You're trying to learn these different kinds of filters, which are ultimately your feature extractors. Now, Something that you have to keep in mind is that we have been only defining this concept for 2D images, or rather we were treating an image as a matrix. But as we saw earlier, if we are working with something like an RGB image, that is more of a tensor because it has three different channels, right? How do we sort of generalize this process of a convolution to an input image with multiple channels? Well we were earlier only considering a filter that was also a matrix. What if we also add a depth to each filter, right? So this would mean that we could still slide over the filter along the height and the width and take our dot products as normal. And I think this um, animation over here does a good job of sort of illustrating the point. Um, uh, this like highlighted white part represents what the filter is looking is what the filter is in this particular image, and you can still see that you can like slide it over, because this filter has the same depth as the as the input image, right? And 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 this is something that you have always have to keep in mind that if you're working with like three D inputs, you 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 would want your filter to have the same depth as you know your input. Now, this single filter and it's like process of convolution forms a convolutional layer. We take in this like 3D in, uh, input, we slide a filter along it, and we get something called a convolved feature out. And it turns out that in, in, the, in the CNN literature, this convolved feature map is also called an activation map because it sort of represents the activation of different kinds of features. Again, um, it, the way you can think about this intuitively is that if you have a high value, it's this activation map is sort of saying, if you have a high value in this activation map, that is sort of saying that there is a good chance that this feature extractor activated, or rather, Oh, th there was a feature in the input image that activated this feature extractor and gave and resulted in a, in a high value at the end. So hopefully that gives you some intuition as to why this output might be called an activation map. Um, don't worry too much about why it's called that. that. It's just something I wanted to put out there because you might notice this in a paper or something, but yeah. Now, earlier we were only convolving an image with a single filter and that gives you one and that can extract a single feature from the image, right? What if we want to extract different kinds of features from an, from an input and use information about all of them? 
Well, we can simply do that by using more filters. So, you know, instead of using a single filter, what if we had six different filters, we would get six different activation apps, which would represent the activations for each different, uh, uh, for each of the features, right? Now, recall that each activation map is simply a matrix and we are getting six of these matrices. What if we concatenate those? Or what if we like sort of squish these together? What does this remind you of? Recall back to our discussion of representing images in an RGB format. We were saying that each image can broke each color can be broken down into an RG and B component, and we could build matrices for all three components and squish them together. And this gives an image a depth. Similarly, we can give your activation map a depth. And in a sense, this activation map is also going to have a 3D structure. And this is going to be a tensor. So, you know, another way to think about this process is you want to extract different kinds of features from this like 3D image. And the 3D comes from the fact that it has like multiple channels. And the way you can do that is by looking at different kinds of filters convolving and 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 convolving that image with all all of those filters uh right so let's say that you have four different filters as in this you know as, as in this example given over here you would sample each patch from the image and take its dot product with all different filters to get an output and you would slide and when you're sliding your patches across the image you would sort of keep repeating this process for all, 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 all four possible filters, right? And so in the end, instead of you know concatenating a single feature together into an activation map, you're concatenating four features at the same time. And this also gives you a 3D uh, output. This is exactly the same process that's going on over here, but uh, this might be a, a different way to think about this. So you know, instead, instead of like instead of convolving each input image by a filter separately and then you know stacking the outputs after the convolutions have happened you could also view this as a single convolution that's going on but with four filters at the exact same time and you're building your output in in that particular way so in a sense we could generalize this convolution operation so instead of saying that we are taking in an image as our input we could take in any 3D tensor as an input. And this 3D tensor would have, you know, some sort of height, width, and a depth, which is represented by the number of channels it has. Um, we know that uh, if you're working with a 3D input, we would also want to have a 3D filter. So this filter would have, this, filter, this these filters are usually square. So they would have a height and width given by, I don't know, some letter K, because uh, another name for a filter is a kernel. And these would also have a depth of C because that is what the that is because that is the depth of the original input image, right? And say that you're working with F different filters. Now this would mean that your output is going to be uh, is also going to be a three D tensor, but with a depth of F because the number of channels in the output is simply dictated by how many filters you use in the first place. And you would, and this output would also have some height and width given by H prime and W prime. We don't know what those numbers are yet. We will get to those in just in, in a few minutes. But, but the main point you take away from this discussion is that this convolution operation is sort of very general. And instead of just being applied to images, it can be applied to any 3D input. And what this allows you to do is if we sort of keep this abstraction of an image as just a 3D volume, we can start stacking convolutional layers on top of each other. And this is exactly what leads to deep learning. You recall that a deep learning or a deep neural network is simply a stack of layers that each learn representations, right? And this, this like abstraction is what allows us to do that. Now, I simply could have ended the lecture right here because I think I've gone over all the big ideas that you need to know to you know, start working with CNNs. But I'm also going to go into some implementation details that I think are important to know when you're working on projects and something and, 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 and such. So um, 
and CNNs, or actually, there there is this concept of something called the receptive field. And this idea is actually not limited to just CNNs. This is actually more uh, prevalent in neurobiology and, and, and psychology. And I think computer scientists like simply stole that term from like those areas and applied it to a CNN. In fact, I believe if you were to like search Google search like a receptive field, you would probably see more results from biology literature than uh, CS literature. And I, I, I don't know if this is true, but I, I think there's a pretty good chance that it is. So um, a receptive field simply refers as, as a concept that is defined for each element of an activation map. And it's simply saying, um, and it, it's simply saying that it's, it's simply describing the region of the input that each element of an activation map is influenced by. So if we look at this example over here, say that we have this like five by five input, we convolve this five by five input with a three by three filter, and this gives us a three by three activation map. Just assume that we are working with the depth of one here, just like make things simpler. But of course, this concept will apply to um, depths greater than one as well. So we, we get this activation map. And what we can do is we can apply another convolution on top of this activation map to get another activation map with, with a single element. Now, the single element over here is connected, is, or is rather is, is influenced by all nine pixels in the first activation map. And each pixel in the activation map is further influenced by nine different pixels of an, of an input. So, if you were to like think about the single element in the second activation map as 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 a single as as a whole, we are saying that the entire five by five region is gonna influence this single um, element, right? Because if you know something were to change in this very first patch over here, that would change this element in the sec in the first activation map over here, and that would also influence the result. That that would also influence the element in the second activation map. So we are saying that this input has a receptive field with height five and with five because that is precisely the region of the of the original image that is that it is being influenced by. Um, and, and it turns out that there are many ways to get the same receptive field, so you don't need to sort of stack two different three by three convolutions on top of each other. If you were to say apply a single five by five convolution instead to just like five by five input, you would also get an activation map whose element has a receptive field given by a height of five and a width of five as well. Now, this, this receptive field is a, is a pretty important concept because we ideally want the, um, so so let's 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 look at what's what's going on in this example over here again. We say that the receptive field of of a single element in the first activation map is going to be three, and we know that the receptive field of the element in, in the second activation map is going to be five. So what's happening is as we add more and more layers, we are increasing the receptive field of our network, right? And this is pretty important because we don't want the network itself to have a small receptive field, but we also don't want it to have a big receptive field. So let's say that you, you build a CNN network and the very last activation map in this network ends up having a receptive field that is too big, or rather it's, it's big enough to be similar to the size of the input. That's not really any different. That's, that's not really anything different from just passing the input in as a single dense layer, right? Because what what's really happening is you, you're instead of like looking at patches, in the end you still have an element in your network that is being influenced by the whole image, and that's not that's not particularly different from the dense network formulation that we had earlier. But on the other hand, if we have a receptive field that's too small, then it can miss uh, information inside an image. I think this sort of idea would be uh, clearer with this example over here. Say that this orange, this like this region marked by this orange square is represented by this like five by five 
region of pixels in this like force activation map and this um, blue patch or this like smaller blue patch in the top left corner of this like orange box is represented by this like three by three region of pixels in this, in this activation map. So let's assume that we convolve this um, layer one with a three by three convolution and we get our layer two. Now, the la the this, this second layer has a receptive field that is kind of small, right? If we were to say cut off our network after layer two, if we were to pretend that layer two does not exist, then each element in this activation map is only looking at a region of the image that is the size of this blue box over here. Let's say that our goal was to classify the brand of a car. In order to do that, we must know what the whole car looks like, right? But this blue box certainly doesn't contain enough information. However, if we were to say add in a third layer by convolving the second layer, then this third layer is an activation map whose feature is being influenced by this entire orange box in, in a sense, right? So we are saying that this particular element in layer three captures all the information inside this orange bounding box, for example. And this is much more helpful for our car classification task than uh, if we were to say, look at the pixels in, in activation layer two instead, in activation map two instead, right? So this can give you, maybe hopefully this gives you some intuition as to why small active, small receptive fields are bad. But on the other hand, if we were to say have a network that with a, with a, or if we were to say we have a recept, we have an activation map with an element whose receptive field sort of covers the whole image, then that's kind of akin to passing that image as a vector, right? That's sort of the intuition behind this idea. Again, don't worry too much about if you don't worry too much if you don't quite get what's going on over here. It's a pretty it's 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 a concept to keep in mind, but it's not particularly too important. In fact, um, I think there might be a different way to view this concept. So earlier we said that increasing the number of layers increases the receptive field. Um, so what, what this is really saying is that if you add too many layers, you're you're making the receptive field too big, and this can lead to you know overfitting. However, if you're not including too many layers and your receptive field is kind of small, then your 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 um, model is like not looking at big enough patches and you might not get good enough performance. So your model is sort of underfitting. So in in essence, this idea of subject fields kind of leads back to this idea of overfitting and underfitting that we saw in, in an earlier lecture. And it does align with our intuition. We, we, we kind of expect that if we make the model too big, then the model might overfit. But if the model is too small, then the model might underfit. And it's it's sort of the same idea over here. It's not exactly that, but I think this might be a more helpful way to think about what a receptive field is actually doing in, in, in a CNN. So we saw that two three by three convolutions have the same receptive field as a five by five convolution. So does it mean that they're the exact same? Like, will they yield the exact same output? Um, and, and the answer is no. So the reason why is, um, when you pass an, an 3D tensor through a convolutional layer and you get like this new like 3D output, you typically apply a nonlinearity to this like 3D block. So what you would do is you would apply say something like a ReLU or a sigmoid to each element in this like 3D block to introduce nonlinearities into your network in order to learn nonlinear decision boundaries. So if you have uh, two different convolutions, you're going to have two different nonlinearities instead. But if you were to have a single five by five convolution, you would only introduce one nonlinearity after this like convolutional layer, right? So yeah, so, so this means that the output of two convolutions is not the same as that of a single convolution, even if they have the same receptive field, because it's possible to stack in more non more activation functions with with, with more convolutions, right? And Intuitively, that is 
what we really want. We want to learn nonlinear functions, right? That is what a neural network actually does. So sort of going back to this idea of a receptive field, we saw that as we add more and more layers, we are increasing the receptive field uh, by, uh, 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 we, we, are, we, we are increasing the receptive field like incrementally every time. So if we, you know, stack two different three by three convolutions, we move from an RF of three to an RF of five. If we do like three different three by three convolutions, we might move to an RS, RF of seven, right? So in a sense, we are increasing our receptive field linearly. What if we want to increase the receptive field like faster? And why might you want to do that? Uh, if, if you're increasing the field linearly, it's possible that by the time you get to a receptive field that's you know kind of big enough, you have you have used way too many layers to get there. And this can make your model like too large and training large models can be very tricky. So it turns out that there is sort of a hack to like speed up like this like increase in size of your, of your, of your RF. And one way to do that is by something called a pooling layer. Now a pooling layer, mechanically what it does is you look at some square region of your input and you apply either you apply one of two different operations. You can either take the maximum element in each square and you can like slide the square along your original input or you could take the average of of each square. Thus the, the, the function where you take the maximum is called max pooling and where you take the average is called average pooling, right? So well, what, what's really happening is when you look at like these two by two chunks of of, of your input, you are, and you're only picking like a single value from each of them, you're essentially halving the dimensions of your input by two. Again, notice over here, how we started with a four by four input, but we ended up with a two by two output instead because we are only picking a single value from each chunk of four pixels, right? Um, and, and in a sense, what we are saying is that each pixel, and, and, and another way to phrase that is each pixel in the output of the pooling layer is connected to four different pixels in the in, is the in the input layer. So, in a sense, you have increased you you have scaled your receptive field by a factor of two. Now you can also do um three by three pooling layers where instead of like breaking an image down into two by two chunks, you break it down into three by three chunks instead. You can also do four by four, five by five, although I feel like at that point that, that might lead to a degradation in performance. I think two by two is very, very common. I have seen three by three before, but it's it's not as common. And I've basically never seen anything with four by four or something bigger. So this is one sort of hack to increase the receptive field. And it turns out that this pooling, these pooling layers also have um, an intuitive meaning. So say that this activation map in this example is going to give you a high number if it's detecting a circle and it's going to give you a low number if it's not detecting a circle, right? So let's say that the presence of this 12 means that there is a circle in sort of this region of the input. Uh, this 13 means that there's another circle over here. This 14 means there's another circle over here. But these like low numbers like five, three, and seven means that there is no circle in this region of the input, right? If you take the maximum and you sort of like, uh, and, and, and you look at the information that's passed over, what we are saying is we are, we are preserving the most important information from a local region, right? We are passing this 12 over because this 12 was representative of the presence of a feature because it had a high value. Similarly, when we take the maximum of five, five, three, and seven, we pass along the seven, which is a low value. And we know that this region did not have, say, a circle. So this low seven would still indicate that in the in in in, 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 in the output, right? So you can view max pooling as a way to sort of like extract important information from a localized area.
hopefully that intuition behind max pooling makes sense. These max pooling layers are very common to 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 uh to first of all reduce the the spatial dimensions of the activation map at each at each stage. So you need like less and less layers in order to make your model like more compatible with the compute you may have. Um, there is also this idea of something called padding. So recall that we are convolving an image with a filter. We are getting an output that is typically smaller in both height and width. What if we want to preserve the height and the width? Well, so if, if you look at the very left over here, we are convolving a four by four image with a three by three filter, and that gives you a two by two output. What if we want to have, what if we want to make sure that the output um, activation map has the same height and width as the input image. Now, one way to do that, we know that we are always going to be decreasing the height and width is we could simply increase the height and width of the input image such that when you perform the convolution, you get a reduced height and width that's the same as the height and width of the original input. So uh, in, the, in the middle, you have this five by five um, image you know that if you were to perform a three by three convolution on top of this, you would get a three by three output instead. But if you artificially increase the dimensions of this five by five image to a seven by seven image, and you perform a convolution on that instead, then you would get an output that has that is also five by five and hence the same dimension as the as the original input. Now, why might you want to do this? There are many reasons. Um, in fact, uh, this process is actually so common that it actually has a special name. So when you are artificially increasing the size of your of your input, one way to do that is by simply surrounding it with a bunch of zeros because zeros are a very zero is a very neutral number and it doesn't which means that it's not going to really affect your output in, in, in any way, or it's going to have a very small effect on the output, right? So when you pad your inputs dimensions with a bunch of zeros or you know any other constant value, I just use zeros because that is the most common, but you can also surround it with a bunch of ones or twos, like no one's gonna stop you, but that's like very, very uncommon in order to like preserve like the spatial dimensions of your of your of your activation map this sort of padding is called same padding because you would have the same dimensions right however if you simply don't have any padding and just perform the convolution operation as is you would get valid padding because this is a, a valid output this is what the convolution operation is supposed to do before you padded the input with something else um you might, so um, there is no particular reason why one sort of padding is better than the other. It's just a preference that people have. And I think the deep learning community as a whole, as a large, tends to prefer same padding, even though there is no particular empirical evidence that one leads to better performance over the other. Uh, it's just a matter of preference. And I think a good chunk of the community supports, uh, likes having same padding because I, it's, I think it's like slightly cleaner because if you are say starting with a 256 by 256 image and your activation map is also 256 by 256, it feels less awkward than saying a 254 by 254 activation map, right? So I think that's kind of the only reason why practitioners prefer having the same padding. There is also another concept called the stride. So recall that a convolution is simply this like sliding window where you take the dot product of the filter with like different patches of the in, of the of the um input, and you slide this filter by one pixel every time. However, no one's really stopping you from sliding it sliding it by an amount higher than that. You could slide the convolution, you can slide the filter every two pixels instead. And that is a perfectly valid operation. Um, 
why would you want to do this? So it turns out that strided convolutions actually sort of have the same effect as a pooling layer, because if you are sliding a filter every two pixels instead, this would mean that you are skipping sort of every other pixel along the height and the width. And this would mean that your output activation map has roughly half the it has dimensions that are roughly half the original height and half the original width. Um, it's not going to be exactly half. It's going to be like roughly half, which is why you could view a strided convolution as sort of an approximation to a pooling layer. Um, is there a reason to use a strided convolution over a pooling layer? Again, not particularly. I think there was a big debate over this idea a few years ago, but I don't think there was any particular conclusion that came out of it. Uh, I think people just use whatever they find, I guess, like more convenient, I guess. Again, using a stride of bigger than one is akin to um as a kind is akin to combining the convolution and pooling layers together, but there is no particular advantage to doing it. You could essentially treat the stride as a hyperparameter in your convolutional layer. Now this so earlier I mentioned that your output is going to have some dimension that we don't know yet. And it turns out that this dimension depends on like many factors. It depends on what the dimension of the original input was, what the dimension of each, you know, of, of, of each filter is, what padding you are using, what strides you are using. And it turns out that there is this very nifty formula that gives you what the, um, what, what the output dimensions of your of your activation map would be like. So again, if you take in an input dimension with of, of say with W, um filter size F, padding size P, and strides S, you would get an output with a width given by this formula over here, where the seal function is simply the ceiling function. Ceiling function is the greatest integer that is um or is is, is gonna be the is gonna be an integer or, or rather the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to you, the input. Uh, yeah, this formula is really helpful for uh, trying to decide what kind of strides and paddings and filter sizes you want to use. Because what you can do is say, if you want to try to use, um, if you're designing a convolutional layer, such that your output activation, such that your activation map has the same dimension as the input, you can equate this equation equal to W and solve for say P or S or F, et cetera, et cetera, to determine what size you want to make certain components of your convolutional layer. And so that's sort of the main details that you want to know behind what behind the anatomy of a convolutional layer. Um, and we will sort of delve into some more technical stuff now. So let's discuss what a convolution, convolutional layer really is doing. A convolution is basically just a bunch of multiplications and additions, right? And we discussed during the deep learning lecture that if you're just doing a bunch of additions and, and you know products and stuff like that, you could back propagate gradients through these operations. So what, what what this means and 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 we we saw this in the context of fully connected layers because um, recall that a fully connected layer is simply doing a matrix multiplication followed by an addition by a bias vector right since a convolutional layer is nothing more than this process but in a different form you could also back propagate gradients to a convolutional layer now how this is done is not something you have to worry about because your favorite library PyTorch will handle this for you. Um, this command that is on this page is going to be very, very important because you're probably going to use it in every single homework that you come across in this class, along with any project that you work on that involves CNNs. So the way you define a convolutional layer in PyTorch is you, you have to pass in like multiple parameters into it. So your in channels parameter is simply the depth of your of your input tensor, right? So we know that 
if you're passing in an RGB image, this in channel is just going to be um, three. But if you're passing in some other 3D block, then you have to like look at how many channels it has and pass that in instead. The out channels is going to be the number of channels or the depth of your of your output. So essentially the out channels is how many filters you want this convolutional layer to have. Your kernel size is simply the dimension of the filters, like the height and the width. And again, you can define different parameters like the stride, the padding. There's also other terms like dilation, groups. You don't need to know what that is because you don't really change the default values. You just sort of go along with the defaults given here. The only parameters that you really change in a C in a, in a con 2D layer are in channels, out channels, the kernel size, the stride and padding, depending on what you want your CNN to look like. Again, uh, the documentation for this layer is given by this link. I would highly encourage you guys to visit it at some point, read through it, once to understand what's going on. Okay, so we talked about these like classification layers and these pooling layers and what we can do is we can pass an image through, you know, stacks and stacks on, and, 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 and we can like pass an image to a network that is simply a stack of these C con and pooling layers on top of each other. Now, the input and output to these layers is still going to be a 3D tensor, right? So let's say that after you pass in this like 3D image through a bunch of layers and you get this like 3D output out, how do you turn that into say a prediction if you're trying to work on a classification task? Now, what usually happens is by the time this like huge input has been processed by these multiple layers, this 3D output at the very end usually has small, like it, it's usually like very low dimensional, right? So you, you're not going to have like this like 200 by 200 by three image that you had earlier. You might have something that's like 64 by five by five instead. And that is a much more manageable number if we were to say convert this 3D block into a vector and pass that in to a fully connected network, right? So essentially what's going on is you can view these CNN layers and these pooling layers as a feature extractor that converts this high dimensional input into some low dimensional block of features that can be passed into an MLP for a final classification task to you know, yield the input. This is exactly what we discussed in the representation learning part of the last lecture. We could break a machine learning pipeline into the feature extraction and the prediction parts. And that's exactly what's going on over here. Um, everything outside of this red box is simply a feature extractor. Everything inside of this red box is a, is a, is a classifier and we can simply combine both parts into a single neural network. And this idea is not that foreign to a CNN. It's, it's simply the same idea that you apply to dense neural networks, but with images as well. Again, just to sort of recap, um, a convolutional layer has many different hyperparameters that um, sort of make up this anatomy. So you have, you have to define the stride that each filter will like slide by. You have to define if you're extend if you're extending the input by any particular amount of padding, and you would have to choose what the kernel size of the filter is that you're sliding over your input. Um, you would also have to define the pooling layer. So you would have to define how big you want to sort of like pool how how big you want the kernel of the pooling layer to be. Typically a size of two is, is, is pretty common. And you might decide between max pooling and average pooling. I think that the norm, at least in, in the deep learning community uh, right now is to go with max pooling. I haven't really seen average pooling being used that frequently, but it does exist. I want you to keep that in mind if you're trying to you know read online implementations of different kinds of CNNs, 
or you know reading uh, different research papers, you might come across this at some point. And finally, these two layers make up the feature extraction part of a CNN. Once the features have been extracted, you could flatten them out and pass those through your classification layers, which form your basic cookie cutter MLP that you are already familiar with from lectures two and three. So we have been sort of describing a CNN at a, at a very conceptual level. Let's actually look at what a real life CNN looks like. So this is a network called Laynet. This was developed by Jan LeCun for um, classifying handwritten digits. So I don't know why this has the letter A. I think a number here would have been more appropriate, but really what's going on is you take an input, you convolve this input into six 20 by 28 feature maps, which means you, you must have used six different uh, filters. You pool here, um, subsampling is just another name for pooling. You pool these 28 by 28 activation maps into 14 by 14 activation maps. You basically have the size of the width and the height. You apply another convolution on top of those and you apply the pooling um, operation again until you get a much small, uh, until you get like a smaller representation of your input. So here, the 16 by five by five um, tensor block contains um, about 400 elements, but this 32 by 32 um, input contains a thousand elements. And you can see that this is much more wieldy than this like thousand dimensional input, which you can then pass into like different kinds of like polyconnected layers and get an output at the end where this 10 represents, you know, one of the 10 possible digits that you see from zero to nine. Um, in fact, all classification architectures that are based on CNN sort of look like this in a sense. So usually once you get your input, you stack convolution and pooling layers on top of each other. Again, recall that you apply a non-linearity after each convolutional layer. In this case, I've chosen ReLU. It, it, it can be any non-linearity for that matter, but I think ReLU is very, very common. You could keep stacking these like con ReLU pool combinations on top of each other, flatten the result and pass those through like a fully connected network. Or another common design pattern that you usually see is instead of doing a con ReLU pool, you do a con ReLU, con ReLU, and then a pool. So you go through, you go through two different combinations. You, you go through two different convolutions before applying a pooling operation. And after that, it's, it's the exact same story. Or recall that you learned about this layer called a batch norm in lecture three. This is a normalization layer that makes the training more stable. And in modern architectures, you might you might see this, this like batch norm layer more and more frequently. And typically this is inserted between a ReLU and a con layer. So you could also do like a con ReLU batch norm, con ReLU batch norm pool, repeat this as many times as you want, flatten and pass that through. Uh, yeah, classification layers. These design choices are very common. In fact, a lot of popular architectures that you will cover in lecture six are going to use one of these patterns. Okay, so we have designed, we have finally gone over what a CNN is at the end. Let's talk about some more practical details. So when you're training a network, you would ideally want to train it on some sort of data set, right? There are some common data sets that people use very frequently in the field of CV. And I think you should be familiar with those if possible. So one of those data sets is the MNIST handwritten digit classification data set. These are I actually can't recall if this is supposed to be 28 by 28. I think this might be 32 by 32 instead. But these are basically like grayscale images that uh, each contain a single digit from like zero to nine. And um, I, I think this data set is like, I think this data set has a 
it's it's not a particularly big data set. I think it's relatively small, but it's also like relatively easy to work with. There is another popular data set called CIFAR 10. This has um 60K examples with like 50K training examples and 10K examples that you can set aside for validation or testing. Um, these are 32 by 32 RGB images. So unlike MNIST, which only had grayscale images, you actually have multiple channels in a, in a, in a CIFAR um, data set. The 10 stands for the fact that each, uh, each image can be classified into one of 10 Clifton classes. So MNIST and CIFAR 10 are actually very commonly used as in, in, when, uh, in proof of concept um, implementations. Say that you are a CV researcher and you come up with some new algorithm, there's a very good chance that you'll try to test it out on a simple data set like MNIST or CIFAR first before moving on to something more complex like ImageNet or COCO. So, yeah, so those are our toy data sets. Now we move on to some serious stuff. The ImageNet data set is a million images and a thousand different labels, where each image is a 224 by 224 dimensional RGB image. Uh, this data set was collected by a team of researchers across many different universities, and it led to the birth of the ImageNet Visual Recognition Challenge, which is how this, the model that we called AlexNet earlier came into being, which started the deep learning of revolution. So this data set actually has a huge history behind it. This data set is also very popular in the sense that when whenever a new architecture pops up, you typically test it on ImageNet to see how well it performs because this data set is actually fairly challenging. And you actually designate state-of-the-art status, status to a model by its performance on ImageNet. In fact, when we say that a model is soda or state of the art in CV, we are usually saying that, okay, it's probably, it probably has the highest accuracy on ImageNet as of right now. But ImageNet at its core is, is only a classification data set. We also discussed other problems like segmentation and, and object detection at the very beginning, right? And it turns out there are pretty common data sets for those tasks too. Um, there is a data set called the Pascal VOC data set, which has different kinds of images for detection and segmentation. There's also the common objects in context or the COCO data set that is also used for these different tasks. Um, I think you will cover more of Pascal and COCO when you actually go through the segmentation and detection lectures. So don't worry too much about those yet. Um, other practical details. So typically when you we, we, we mentioned earlier that each image has a value that is in the range from zero to 256 or 255, right? Typically when you are passing an image into a neural network, you would want to normalize it to a range of zero to one. And it's pretty much the same reason or the same intuition as to why we use batch norm is because using these like small values for the for the overall range can give you like nicer gradients that don't really explode and are kind of like well behaved and it, it and in a sense it doesn't really hurt to like normalize your images it may not help but it almost certainly never hurts one way to do this normalization is through this function called qtensor that is part of the torch vision library um, I have linked the documentation for that over here. So remember to check it out in your um, own time. Finally, uh, this is another pretty important concept when it comes to training uh, CNN models. So a general rule of thumb in deep learning is that the higher dimension your input is, the more of it you will need to train a decent model. We know that images are high dimensional. Um, a 256 by 256 by three image is 256 by 256 by three dimensional, right? That's 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 a huge number. And this would also mean that you would need a lot of data to train a good classification network, a good classification network, for example, right? However, collecting data is expensive. Collecting data is hard. And you also want to make sure that when you are collecting and labeling data, it's all coming from a somewhat similar distribution, because if it's not, you're gonna run into problems with multimodality and that can make training difficult. 
So the idea is that we, we want to get more data, but it's hard. And, and having more data can never hurt. More data can help you sort of prevent the problem of overfitting that we discussed in, in lecture two or lecture three. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's always a good thing. Now, luckily, you can artificially create more data from a single image. Now, let's say that you're training in uh, a network for an animal species classification task. So let's say that this image in the top left is the original image and you would predict the label llama for, for, for it, right? If you were to say, flip the image or you know maybe crop some part of it or maybe change the brightness or the contrast or maybe change the coloring slightly, it doesn't really change the fact that the image it, it doesn't really change the fact that a llama is still present in the image, right? The semantic content of the image is so preserved despite these augmentations. So what you can do is you can create like these new images from the original image and assign them the same label and voila, you, you, you have essentially created new data. This is a very cheap and easy way of creating new data from your from your pre-existing data sets. And there is no real reason to not use these at all. In fact, every uh, CV pipeline that you will see out in the real world will use some sort of data augmentations in order to train a somewhat decent model. Um, yeah, there are many different kinds of data augmentations possible, like changing the color, changing the lightning, uh, lighting, flipping the image. Um, if you want to go through a more comprehensive list, I would recommend visiting the Torch Vision documentation online because that is typically how you would implement these in PyTorch. And finally, um, model checkpointing. So CNNs are typically huge models. You're also working with huge data sets. This means that your training, your, your training time is usually very long and you're also requiring a, a good amount of compute. Like, uh, you you know, maybe you're possibly training on NVIDIA GPUs, for example, right? But even then, it can still take a lot of time to like train a decent model. Now, uh, this could take anywhere from, you know, our minutes to even hours to days to weeks. And I'm not even exaggerating, but I've also heard of models that were trained for months at a time. And what would happen if your training were to like suddenly stop in the middle? You do, I don't know, maybe the your your machine crashed or your server that you were training on shut down, for example. You've basically lost all of the progress that you have made so far, right? And that would suck. Uh I'm I'm saying this from personal experience. I um, didn't really notice how big of a deal this was until I started losing my progress when I was not checkpointing. So one way to prevent this from happening to you is to like simply store your model weights in a file as you're training. Let's recall what's really happening in the training process. You, you have your parameters of the model are updating, right? Through some sort of like gradient based optimization process. What you can do is you can store like snapshots of the of the parameters at like different points of the training process. And if your machine does go down and your training is interrupted, you could go to the latest snapshot and pick off from where you left. It's almost like nothing really happened, right? Um, this is a very good habit to roll up. Again, I didn't, when I started working on deep learning, uh, I did not get into the habit of checkpointing my models until I sort of learned it the hard way. And I don't want any of y'all to go through the same experience that I did. So again, remember to set up checkpoints. Uh, CNN training can take a very long time. You don't want to lose your progress if something goes wrong in the middle. And yeah, well, that is about it for the CNN's presentation. Um, hopefully it made sense to you guys. Uh, this is a pretty foundational lecture because CNNs underlie a lot of the models that we will be talking about in the upcoming lectures. 
So it's pretty imperative that you understand this lecture to your to the best of your ability. Of course, feel free to like stop by office hours if you have any questions. We will always be there to like discuss any of the concepts that are covered in here. And thank you.